Tobik, uh, I'm an entrepreneur, founder of oddballstocks.com newsletter, as well as completebankdata.com. Uh, Nate's going to speak to you tonight, and uh, I forgot to mention Nate's also got a couple of software silent option items. I'll let uh, Nate just mention that before he starts as well. Nate? So then uh, about six months later, I come to find that the Bloomberg Terminal has an app store, just like your iPhone or your, your Android. And so I said, Eric, we're going we're gonna to get on this app store. I think we could do it in just a couple weeks. And so he, he knows me. I've worked with him for a number of years. And he says, yeah, OK, fine, we'll, we'll do this. Um, but it took about eight months again. And uh, so that went live in uh, end of January and beginning of February. And, and so we built that tool to specifically, uh, just for, you know, for bank investors, we wanted to tailor this tool just for them and um, a, a way to, to find better investments quickly. And so uh, I kind of fell into this whole banking thing. And I never expected to be up here talking about this sort of a thing. But you know, here I am, and, and that's kind of how life goes, which is always it's an interesting journey. So I, I want to talk about banks and why banking. And banking is a really interesting industry. So there's a, around 1,000 traded banks. And that includes all the little pink sheet banks that most people don't follow. And it's, a, it's really a bet on, on two different things. And so when you buy a bank, you're buying into this local market and you're buying into this management team. And so what's really cool is with all these banks, they're all perfectly comparable to each other. So you could say this little bank in Paducah, Kentucky, how are they doing compared to another bank in Springfield, Illinois? And, and you could look at them side by side and there's very few industries that have 6,500 comps that you can compare a company uh, with, with competitors and down to extremely granular levels and so so th there's this comparison and and so you're at this local level and you know banking allows investors to invest in businesses that we don't have access to so a local bank might be investing in they might be offering loans to the farmers to a hairdresser to a local hardware store and as investors, it's very difficult to get those investments. And a, a bank's making them, 
the bank might loan the money and say six percent. As an investor, we're you know we're we're going to get maybe four percent of that or so, and that's about what the farmer or the hardware store is going to do anyway. So we're we get about the same return that that local business person is, is earning on their business through our exposure to banks. And uh, so secondly, banking is about is about management. So you have this local market, and then you have the managers and. You know, there's a lot of brain power in this room just from talking to, to some people beforehand, and this, you know, there's there's a ton of brain trust here. And the good news is, banking does not require brain trust. Banking just requires <laughs> that you avoid losses and you avoid bad credits. And so, if a bank makes loans at a market rate and they pay deposits at a market rate and they just avoid bad credits, they're going to be an above-average bank. And, and so and this is part of the reason why there's 6,500 banks in the U.S. And, you know, they're, they're all, for the most part, doing all right. I think it's 17% or so uh, were nonprofit. They didn't earn a profit the last quarter. So the majority of these, these small banks are, are doing well. And, you know, it doesn't require a rocket scientist, which is great for us. So how do we look at banks? There's a number of different value metrics, the traditional value metrics, price to book, deposit premium, acquisition value. And, and so how we look at banks is this idea of a bank has an intrinsic value that is really two parts, I guess you could say. So we look at the bank's acquisition value. So this is what uh, the private market value of the bank, if the buyer and the seller got together and they said, let's open our books, let's see what, what synergies we have, and that's and then figure out the cost savings. That's the, the acquisition value. That's the private market value with a multiple on that. That's that's the highest level that a bank is going to trade at. And and then so there's this idea of relative value, and this is what a, a bank compared to the multiples of the bank index. And so bank indexes do a really good job of approximating the point in time deal multiple. So if banks are trading and, and selling at, uh, they're selling out at one and a half times book, that's usually about what the, the index multiple is. So you have this range where there's the relative value, which is this point in time, if we were to sell today, what should we probably get? And then this ultimate acquisition value and somewhere between those two numbers is often this intrinsic value concept. And so you look for banks that are trading below both those metrics. So the formula we use for acquisition value is one that was popularized by Richard Lashley of p and Capital. And he looks at a bank's net income plus their after-tax cost savings and then slaps a multiple of 10 on that. And he, he came to this number through a, a lot of research he looked at all the different acquisition multiples and all the, the deal prices over so 10 or 15 years. Uh, and so he, he put a lot of work into creating this actual formula. What was interesting to me is I've talked to a number of bankers and regulators and they've all expressed this exact same concept without putting the numbers to it. So the industry looks at themselves this way and, and he provided this formula as a, as a bit of a shortcut. So in terms of opportunities in the banking arena, I don't know if you guys can see this slide, so maybe some of the evil eyes in the back and otherwise, uh, sorry about that. Um, but you can see there's, there's 1,800 banks with less than $100 million in assets. These are tiny banks. And then you've got 3,200 banks with less than $500 million in assets. And, and from there, the numbers drop dramatically, and there's only 13 with over $150 billion in assets. And, so if you were to look where all of, you know, on an asset weighted basis, obviously all the opportunities are in the largest banks, but there's a number of opportunities in small banks and medium banks, and it seems like there's more, but it's just a proportion thing. So it's because there's so many more small banks. And so just a, a note on this before I, I go into a couple of names. Uh, you know, the, the thing with banking is there's this idea of scale and that you want to have a certain amount of assets and, and once you get over that hurdle, your costs are lower and you can make more money. And the I think the popular notion is that the scale in banking is somewhere above a billion or five billion in assets. And the FDIC did a study where they, they looked at this idea of, of scale where the economies of scale kick in. And it's really between 250 million and 500 million in assets. 
So what we consider a bank that's worth investing in or worth researching is really in that, that bucket of about 250 million on up. So there's you know a few thousand banks and that's of traded banks, there's about 600 some in that area. So the first, first company I want to talk about is Eastern Virginia Bank Shares. This is EVBS, and they are uh, the large end of a community bank. So typically a community bank is about a billion dollars in assets or less. They have 1.2 billion, and they recently acquired the Virginia, Virginia Community Bank, and they have a $79 million market cap. So this is kind of a typical larger community bank where they're trading now. This bank trades at 86% of tangible book. And you know there's a, a real good reason for that. So they've got a, a lot of bad things. I'll just throw all these things out on the table real quick. They have TARP, they haven't quite repaid at all, which is a problem because the rate on their TARP went from 5% to 9%. They have high cost operations. So 89% of every revenue dollar they're bringing in, they're paying out to, to run the bank. They have a low profitability, which is a result of the, the high cost operations and the, the TARP money. They have a messy capital structure. And then they had these integration costs when they bought Virginia Community Bank. And so they paid out $1.8 million last year in integration costs. And that's that caught my eye because they earned about $4 million in net income. So when those costs are gone next year, suddenly income is going to be 50 percent higher, and, and that's not a, a small increase. The good news is, in banking, even though that, that last slide looked bad, these are all very fixable issues. And so, you know, how do you reduce operating costs? That's, you know, translated, reduce headcount, close branches. Uh, you know, how do you repay the TARP? They could do an equity offering if they needed to, but they've been able to pay a lot out of their operating cash flow. They could clean up their capital structure by just pulling in more deposits. So these are all very fixable issues. And as I mentioned earlier, banking is really all about asset quality and excluding the bad credits. So I've brought a chart here, and you can't even see the numbers. I'm not sure why I included it. But the, the thing that matters is the colors and the direction they're going. And so the, the trend of their credits is their credit quality is getting different. So they have half a percent of non-performing assets to assets. And that's a, that's a good number. Uh, that's lower than the, the national number. The national average, I believe, is about 3%. So the, the good news is they're repaying the TARP. Integration costs should be gone. When TARPs repay, that's another couple of cents to their earnings. And management's aware of all these issues. They seem to be proactive in taking all the steps they need to take to, to move the bank forward. So if we talk in terms of value, I pulled this. This is from the, the version we have at Bloomberg. We have this little valuer type of a tool that has some pre-built models. So uh, you can see on a relative basis, if they were to trade in, in line with peers, they'd be worth $8 a share approximately, and their acquisition value is estimated to be about $11 a share. So the bank trades for slightly over $6 right now. So the, the upside is somewhere between 8 and 11 If they really come out of the gate and they clean all these things up, it could potentially be higher. I mean, of course, anything could be higher, so I'm just, you know, I'm not going to guess on that. Uh, so. That's what we have for Eastern Virginia, and uh, they're an interesting community bank. There are just loads of other cheap banks. I'm not going to go into these. I obviously love this. I've come to love this, and I have slews of tickers. If anyone's interested, quarter me, and I can give you some of them. There's, there's a lot of cheap banks that are small. Uh, but what I think the sweet spot in banking is is really the regional banks. And so these are large banks that really dominate in one area. And they're not too big, so lending still moves the needle. And they're not too small where they're captive to a small town or a small little area. And so in the US, you have a region like the East Coast or the Mid-Atlantic or the Midwest. And often there's one or two dominant banks in that area. And this, these banks also have a lot lower regulatory burden. So there's some regulatory thresholds that are that capture banks, I guess, at about 50 billion in assets. And uh, up from there, as the assets grow, the, the regulations become more onerous. And so regional banks have really been pushing, saying, we don't need to be regulated like Bank of America or Wells Fargo. And the regulators seem to, they've been 
they seem uh, interested in that that notion. So we'll see what happens. We'll see if some of the some of the regulatory burden uh, goes down in the future. So this is a, a chart of relative values for banks with over 100 billion in assets. And so if you if you see there's a one, um, it's right. Here. So if you imagine everything above that line is relatively overvalued and everything below that line is relatively undervalued. So if you look all the way out to the right, you see the furthest right is JP Morgan. Then we have Citigroup is the kind of at the bottom there and Bank of America and then you have Wells Fargo. So uh, JP Morgan, City and Bank of America are considered undervalued. Wells Fargo would be overvalued, and then you get the regional banks here, and you can see there's a lot of a lot of enthusiasm for these banks. They're all trading at, at high relative valuations, and then there's this one little dot there in the bottom left corner that's orange. I don't know if you guys can see that. Uh, that's Fifth Third Bank. So that's the regional bank I'm going to talk about. They are a bank in the Midwest of the U.S. They are headquartered in Cincinnati, Ohio. They have $119 billion in assets. And if you were to, to rank these regional banks in terms of uh, cheapness, they are the best cheap bank that is in this space. And so here's a, you know, a number of their different stats, their, their earnings, where they trade in on book value, their profitability. They, they earn almost 10% on equity. And so there's this notion, and maybe this is a myth I'll bust for, for any bank investors here, that's that anyone earning less than 10% on their equity isn't earning their cost of capital and the bank should be out of business. And so it's, it's less than one third of all banks that earn 10% in this lower rate environment. And so kind of the way I look at it is, so right now the average return on equity is 7% at a bank. And so with the low deposit cost, the return on capital is maybe it's around 7% that average, that's, that's about the average cost of capital. And um, you know, I think that 10% metric that everyone seems anchored to is really a, an artifact from say 2000 to, to 2008 or so. So th this is a good bank even though Probably there's a few of you in the room who see 9.64. It's like, oh, that's out. I can't, I can't look at that. It, it missed the 10%. Um, but they have a, a slightly lower than average net interest margin, and they have a very good efficiency ratio. So they're 59% compared to Eastern Virginia, which is at 89%. That's a, a dramatic difference. If you look at them compared to peers, they're they're the um, the best in terms of cheapness, and then if you take uh, their relative valuation divided by their return on assets, it, they, they come out at the top. So this is a, a the bank has has good metrics. So the question naturally is, why are they cheap? If they're that, really that good of a bank, why aren't they trading well above that that line with the rest of their peers? So there there's a number of reasons, and. Um, show this next slide. So hopefully you can see this. This is the, I pulled the deposit market share data for Fifth Third Bank. So Fifth Third's home market is Cincinnati, Ohio. And if you notice, they're number two in Cincinnati in terms of deposit market share. And number one is U.S. Bank. And uh, U.S. Bank Corps is in almost all the same markets that Fifth Third is in. And they have a higher deposit market share ranking in all those markets. So how do we look at that? The deposit market share is kind of a proxy for popularity in a, in a given area. Uh, they're attracting more deposits. So you have you have Fifth Third as the they're the the second run bank in all these areas. You know they have a, a top deposit share in say Dayton, Ohio, or Toledo, Ohio, but those those aren't big money cities, and those are are, are smaller Midwest cities. So they're lower in the deposit market share. And, and so I included the last line, which is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and that, that's where I live. You see they have 15 branches there. And Fifth Third came into to Pittsburgh and said, we're not gonna acquire anyone, we're gonna grow this market organically. And so they built 15 branches. You can see they have the lowest <coughs> average deposit per branch, and it effectively failed, and the, the strategy failed. They, they didn't gain the traction they were re really looking for. So, you know, there's, um, there's some talk in the market, and these are all unsubstantiated rumors that 
that for PNC to grow, they need to acquire someone. They need to acquire that scale. And so right across the lake, you have First Niagara and Buffalo. They've had some issues. They're on the rocks. The speculation is these guys might sell because the management team isn't going to last there. And so the two, the two names that keep popping up would be Fifth Third and Huntington Bank, which is also in Ohio as potential acquirer. So that would give Fifth Third good regional scale. They would be able to, to move into the east and they don't have almost any presence in the east. So this would get them out of the Midwest, get them into some other areas where they could try to compete again. So a couple of the reasons why they're cheap, they had a slight fall in revenue recently. If you look a couple quarter over quarter, it's, uh, it's trending down like that asset graph I showed a little bit earlier. And so that has investors very scared. And some of that's a result of their uh, the lower net interest margin. So, you know, th there's a lot of reasons why this bank is cheap, and I would also say, though, that if they can get some of these things fixed and, and get their act together, there's also no reason why this bank should be cheap for, for what they do. And, and this is a great space, the regional bank space. So here's our, our model for the estimated value. So you see, you can see they trade for, I want to say it was 19 and change today. I don't remember exactly. I'm sorry. So the overall value is 26 and it would be 21.90 on a relative basis and 26.47 if they were to be purchased. I wouldn't put much faith in Fifth Third being purchased. Uh, that would have to be a very large bank to, to purchase them. And the large bank space is not making acquisitions due to uh, some monopoly sort of issues. So, so from there I'm going to move on and I just have a, a couple slides on large banks and then non-US banks. I'll touch on those real quick. Large banks are really interesting. They're constrained in that they need a lot of the same sort of loans or big deals to move the needle. So they're not interested in making a non-conforming loan or doing some sort of a special financing to a a potentially really good client because they need to just warehouse these loans and they need to, to make as many loans as quick as possible because otherwise they're not going to make their numbers each quarter. But that size is also a benefit to them. So we saw the last financial crisis. They are still around. These big banks that had all sorts of missteps are still around. So it's unlikely they're going to fail in the future and it's also unlikely these things are going to grow gangbusters. But the good news for investors is with all their free cash flow, they're buying back shares, paying dividends. So my view on the big banks is, I think if you're looking for something to stick in a corner of your portfolio to pay some dividends, that's gonna probably grow at double digits. I don't think you would go wrong buying any of these larger banks. So the, you know, the dividends, buybacks, and then, um, so the non-US banks, US, the U.S. banking market is very unique in that we have so many small banks and then this layer of the regional banks and the larger banks. And that's very unique to, to the U.S. There's not many other countries that have this. And so uh, one market that is somewhat similar is France. They have a number of really local banks and then some regional banks and larger banks. And there's a situation there that's, that's worth a look for any uh, Anyone who wants to invest in, in European banks, that's Credit Agricole has a set of about 12 regional banks that are all extremely undervalued on almost any metric you could put together. They're run like private little companies. They pay great dividends. Sometimes they go private at book value and they're all trading at about 30% of book value. So th th that's worth looking at. But really for any bank, it's the same criteria that you would apply to American banks, which is you want that the bet on the local market. So you want a, a good local market. You don't want to be investing somewhere where there's an oversupply of something and a bunch of bad credits. And you, you want to be conservative and look for banks that are just excluding bad credits. And so um, with that, I will take some questions. Oh, and I should mention, so the silent